I learned that Jennifer is bisexual. So she's 5'2", blue eyes, black hair, really pale skin, and freckles everywhere. Now after this, Jen and I start to have lunch on occasion. Sometimes at night we go out for walks. And then with some regularity, we are sleeping together. And she ends up getting a two-bedroom apartment in Prospect Heights with the part-time receptionist, Amy. And now there are these nights when I end up going to Jen's on my own, and there's this super weird intersection where the foliage from the tree is blocking out the street light, and there's this low wall along a driveway, and there's some garbage cans. And now, the abandoned schoolyard on the other side of the street offers very little in the way of comfort, but at least I can see everything. So I'm always crossing the street and walking along the, the school side. Now, when Jen isn't hanging out with me, she's often in the bars and drinking, and then the next day telling me all about it. Last night, Leah Deliria like marched up to me and she said, I'm gonna fuck you so hard you won't know what hits you. And I'm thinking, does that line work? And so the answer is, not in this case. Jennifer laughed it off and went home alone. February 1st, 1999. So after the maternity leave ended, I was in fact hired on full time. So I'm going to my desk, and I notice that all the women are huddled together crying. And JT walks up to me, and she's been crying. Sybil died. And I'm thinking, how can that be? I had just seen her like on Thursday. And it turns out that Friday afternoon, she went to the doctor because she would had this nagging cough that wouldn't go away for like two months. So they x-rayed her chest and they found out she has stage four cancer. So the faithful words of Sybil Carlin were, I'm going to my son's graduation if it's the last thing I do. So Saturday she went to the graduation and Sunday she passed away. Now Jennifer, a couple minutes later, comes up to my desk. Hey. Now, I'd been avoiding Jen for a couple months because she had rather unceremoniously dumped me in the fall so she could date Diane. Now, Diane was a little bit older and kind of like a high school principal, with like a bad haircut and a frumpy style of dress. So, Jennifer's like a nine, Diane's like a five, and I gave them a couple months until Jen got bored and left. And Jen says, do you remember the time Sybil came up to us? I'm like, yeah. So Jennifer and I had been in the kitchen area, and both of us were holding that coffee that's sort of known throughout corporate America. It's free, and it tastes really frightening, even after you put a lot of like sugar and non-dairy creamer in it. And we're standing a little close for coworkers, and Sybil's oblivious to this. Ilsa, I was thinking about you over the weekend. Jen and I make eye contact and I freeze. I'm thinking, does she throw on a dress with spaghetti straps and sit in the park and read? <laughs> Jen giggles, and I take a moment to think about this, because my respect for Sybil grows. Somewhere, if only in this woman's imagination, there's an Ilsa Jewel who wears dresses and sits in the park reading. <laughs> so I say, uh, no, never. <laughs> now, McFadden was a really small company, and Sybil had been a hero to these women in the office. She was 52, she'd weathered a divorce, she'd raised her son on her own, and she was just like this really wonderful person. So uh, a couple days later, we all go out to Long Island, and there's this Jewish funeral, and it was really hard to believe that Sybil was in that plain pine box. March 9th, 1999. So I had just recently moved into a new apartment share on the Upper West Side, and I had very few belongings. A twin futon mattress, an answering machine with a landline, and clothing that hung in the closet. That's it. I woke up at 7.30 in the morning and I felt really, really weird. And I'm like, do I call in sick? I don't know. So around 8 o'clock, I call my boss and I'm like, I won't be coming in today. And a few minutes later, my phone rings. And I was notorious for screening my calls. So the outgoing message plays, hi, you've reached 212-555-1212. Leave a message and I'll call you back as soon as I can. Beep. So the caller hangs up. 
and another 15 minutes, this repeats. And in another 15 minutes, this repeats. So on the fourth time, I answer, hello, it's me, it's Jennifer, and right away, I know someone's died. Amy was murdered, and I'm sitting there going, little Amy, the social worker? This makes no sense. And Jen goes on to say, yeah, detectives were here all night, she was stabbed. And instinctively I knew she'd been stabbed in the corner that I had always crossed the street to avoid. So a few days later, I go to the church for the wake because I really want closure. And now it was during Lent, so no flowers are allowed in the church and there's this little chapel. And I'm not exaggerating when I say there were like a thousand flowers in that chapel because all people from all over New York have been sending flowers and there's this line snaking out the door. So I get to the front and I look at Amy and she looks really pretty bad. And like there was she was puffy and in real life she had been this runner and she had been really careful about what she ate. Now as I leave the church, I get interviewed by Fox 5 News and WEEI Radio, and I say something to the effect that Amy was working to make the world a better place, and if we'd like to honor her memory, we should do the same. March 15, 1999. So Bill Communications had been merged, uh, um, McFadden had been merged into Bill Communications and so our offices moved north on Park Avenue South. This means I'm exiting up the 28th Street subway and walking across the four lanes of traffic, turn the corner, and as I do, I notice there's like an African American man dressed in a navy blue top and pants and work shoes and he's lying on the ground. And somehow I know this guy isn't sleeping, he's dead. It's like he's extra kind of crumpled or something. And I'm like, Daryl from the mailroom? The pay sucks, but suicide? So I hurry in, drop my things in my cube, and I run down to the mailroom, and Daryl's there and he's fine. And it turns out, the guy who was on the sidewalk was a young guy who'd been washing windows, and he'd fallen from the 12th floor by accident, hit the bus stop, and then hit the pavement. And in my youth, I had researched, um, I would researched suicide, and uh, I knew that more than 120 feet is fatal height, so he died on impact. Now, at this point, I actually need to evaluate things. In less than six weeks, there have been three deaths, and it's quite a triumvirate. We've got acute illness, murder, and now by accident. And I'm like, well, if I died tomorrow, what would they have to say about me? And they'd be like, well, she's 32 years old, single, childless, owns no real property, has student debt, a high metabolism, and could hold her liquor. <laughs> so not really much of a legacy, and not much I can do about it in the next 24 hours. <laughs> so I spend the next year going in search of Buddha, and I don't mean reefer. And so I read the Tibetan book of living and dying, cover to cover several times. I discover Thich Nhat Hanh, Pema Chodron. And I decide that every challenging situation that comes my way, I'm going to glean something positive from it. And after a year of this, with no measurable increase in my happiness level, I give Buddha a break. And also, sort of this funk that had persisted in 1999 starts to lift. And around this time, I get a letter from the IRS telling me I hadn't filed my taxes. And I'm like, is this true? I always file my taxes. So I rummage through my papers, and I find my tax return. It's in pristine condition. It's signed and dated like April 2nd, 1999, and it's ready to be mailed. <laughs> now for a second, I'm thinking, should I petition the federal government? And I'm like, dear United States Treasury, last year the people around me were dropping like flies, and I neglected to file my return. Can you forgive me? But then I say, nah, I'm not going to get this loss involved in this. And I file the return, I mail the check for the penalty and the interest, and I move on. But now I'm annoyed. And that annoyance is sort of like another little thing that kind of wakes me up. And now I'm standing on a downtown number six crowded subway platform. And there are these two aunties from the Caribbean and they're having a conversation behind me. And they're talking about a young niece. And I hear one of them say, 
she young. Give her, her faith is small. Give it time to grow. And the words hit me like with this jolt. And I turn and I look at the auntie. In my household, avarice, manipulation, and physical abuse had ruled. So no one talked about faith. And I knew I had some, but it was this little teeny tiny bit, and I thought it was fixed. Like, this is your faith for the rest of your life. And now I'm going, faith can grow? And so the auntie's words set me free and set me on the path to my next adventure, where I went in search of faith, size extra large. 